let's enter into this place of worship together. We're ready to go into God's presence and have a time of being church gathered in this place. So I'm going to pray for us as we go into this time and hand it off to you guys. Okay, sorry. Father, thank you so much that we can come together. And God, thank you that the limitations that are still in place have nothing on you. And so we just want to open ourselves to you in this place and say, come and meet with us with your spirit show up and whisper words of hope and life and future into our souls today. And so we come with a posture of saying we're yours, so come and be with us. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right, well, if you got a chance to catch Joel's message this morning, he talked about the prodigal son, and he talked about how the son coming home was like, like a, a big party, right? He was celebrating. It was a celebration. And then he compared that to that, to church, how church should be a celebration and even in a, a party kind of sense, which I thought was really fun. And it's so true. And praise is part of that celebration, praising and encouraging and loving each other and praising God. So let's do that this morning, this afternoon. I still say that after a year. It's afternoon. I know, right? We all sleep in now. <laughs> okay, so if you want to clap your hands, we're going to sing a new song called Alive and Breathing. Here we go. What holds your heart, what stirs your soul.
thank you so much that we can come here together as a church and sing to you and praise you and lift your name. God, that we have that ability to do that today. Thank you, Jesus.
You guys can grab a seat. You know, as I was thinking about this, this, just this season we're in right now as a church, as a society, as we're so excited about the hope of emerging from COVID and getting back to what normal will start to look like, this word came to mind that I was like, I don't, I don't like this word, but <laughs> the word that was just sitting in my mind was this word surrender. And I was just thinking, like, God, I don't, I don't like that word. I feel like that's what I've been doing for a year and a half of my life. But I think it's an important word because I think there's something beautiful in it. And so we're going to talk about surrender. Have you ever been in a moment or a circumstance or a situation in your life where you had to completely surrender yourself to another person? Like, that can be terrifying. When I was in university, I went rock climbing with a bunch of friends. And our one buddy said, I know what I'm doing. So we just said, cool, and went with him out to the SoCal Mountains. And we set up these single pitch climbs. And we just started rock climbing for fun, because that's what you do. You don't, you know, normally, you find out if the person knows what they're talking about or not. But we're just, let's do this. And I remember I clipped in. We got all the fancy language, like on belay, belay on, climb on, all that stuff. And so I just start scaling, and I hate heights. Like, I'm terrified of heights, but I got to be, like, cool because I'm with my guy friends and all that stupid stuff. But we're going through, and so I finally get to the top where you've now topped out. You can't go any farther because the rope is literally at the end of the, the top of the pitch. And, and I remember just kind of holding on to the rock, and I'm like, well, what, what do I do now? And I hear this voice from below from my friend saying, let go. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, let go. And I was white knuckling that rock with everything that I've got because in my mind, I'm like, no, no, that's the last thing I want to do. Like, this is what is safe. This is what's secure. I mean, I don't like where I'm at, but this is what I know to do. And I just remember feeling that moment that, that there was just this terror inside of me. Like, and I realized that I, I had to, to, to figure something out with my friend. Like, am I willing to completely surrender myself to him in this moment? Am I willing to let go and let him do this? And see, when, when you come to a moment of surrender to another person, you are completely entrusting yourself to them, which is why it is so scary, which is why it's terrifying, because I think it's safe to say we've probably all been burned in relationships at one point or another in our life. Like I did trust someone, I did surrender to them, and it didn't go well. And so the thought of surrendering myself to someone that maybe isn't safe doesn't make any sense. But, but there is a good kind of surrender. Like if the person we're surrendering ourselves to is good, they're trustworthy, they're competent, they know what they're talking about. Like I've, I've had to have surgery a few times in my life. And I just remember talking with the doctor beforehand, and they're like, I got you. I know what I'm doing. We're going to fix that hernia. We're going to fix that broken bone. We're gonna, like, it's going to be okay. And, and in that moment, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to surrender because I believe you. I believe that you will take care of me. And I, I think walking with Jesus is like that. It, it's this ongoing dance with him of, do I really trust you? Do I really believe that you're good? Do I really believe that you're looking out for me? Can I surrender myself to you? And see, I think so often what will happen in life is that it's going good, and then something happens. We hit a challenging circumstance, a challenging situation. Can we be really honest? We do something stupid. <laughs> and suddenly we're in a place of like, oh, my, oh no, where am I? And and yet we can hear Jesus speaking to us in that moment, like speaking to us through the scriptures and his word, speaking to us through his spirit. And it's like he comes in and he's just like, let go. That thing you're holding on to that seems so important to you right now, that thing that you think is going to be the, the, the answer to all your problems, let go. And see, I think if we can come to those moments in our story where we choose to surrender to Jesus because we believe that he's good and he's for us, that surrender, that trust, is probably the most important life-changing decision we can make. And Jesus talks about this idea of surrender when he's hanging out with his first followers. We, we see this story in John's account of his life. John 12, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. They're celebrating Passover, this huge Jewish celebration. And 
And Jesus talks about this idea that, that hey, he, he's trying to clue them in. His death is coming, but hey, don't worry. It's not the end. It's actually a beginning of something really good. And, and so in the midst of this, there's crowds of people that have come to see him. And so John tells us this in John 12, 20, 22. He says that some Greeks had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, which would be uncommon because Greek people didn't do Passover. That was just what Jewish people did. And so here's some like tourists, some outsiders that are kind of hanging out. And they're like, hey, let's, let's just check, check this Passover thing out. And, and they actually want to encounter Jesus. And so they had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And they paid a visit to Philip, to one of Jesus' followers, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And, and they said to Philip, sir, we want to meet Jesus. And so Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together and asked Jesus. And, and I think it's just this little interesting note that, that John lets us know, that here's these Greeks, these outsiders, that want, they want to encounter Jesus but they don't know how to get to Jesus. They're not Jewish. And so they find Philip. You know what's interesting about Philip's name? It's a Greek name. So here's these Greek guys that find somebody that at least is sort of Greek. <laughs> and they're like, hey, can you help connect us to Jesus? And I, I, just, I love that. It just makes me wonder, like, who am I a connection for? Like, who is somebody in my life that would really want to encounter Jesus, but they just need a hookup? Who are you a connector for? And so they come to Philip, and Philip's like, okay, let's go, let's go. And, you know, Jesus is, Jesus is Jesus. Like, he's always inviting people to come to him. But his response to this is really weird. Listen to what he says. So, hey, Jesus, there's these Greek guys that want to meet you. And this is what Jesus says. So Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies... It remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And I got to think if you're Philip, you're like, so do you want to meet him or not? Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And, and yet here's Jesus. He, he starts to use this harvest analogy. That, like, hey, you plant something and it dies, but then it produces a crop, right? And he's talking about what's about to happen to him. Like, hey, I'm about to die, but it's not the end. It's actually going to be a new, new beginning, and this is for everyone. So those Greek guys that want to meet me, what's about to happen isn't just for us. It's for them, too. This is going to be for everyone. This ending is going to be a beginning for the human race. And then he says this. Jesus says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. And so Jesus is like, hey, you want to know who gets this new life? You want to know who gets to step into it? It's those who are willing to lose their life as it is. And walk with me into something new. And that's how every single one of us steps into this new life that Jesus has for us. Like we, like we come to this moment of surrender. Where we come to this point in our journey, in our story, where we suddenly realize, I, I need you, Jesus. I, I need you at work in my life. If you've stepped into that new life, I'm, I'm going to guess that somewhere along the way you recognize you needed him. Even if you started there like me, I started like as a four-year-old, and my brother told me there was no Santa Claus in the middle of June, and so my mom explains to me the whole Jesus thing, and I'm like, that sounds cool. But there were still moments in my life where I had to come and say, like, oh, that's just not cool, Jesus. Like, I actually need you to show up in my story. And so often that moment of surrender comes when we hit a, we hit a wall or we hit brokenness or or there's something in our lives that we need him to show up. And it starts with that moment of surrender. I need you. But this is why when Jesus talks about the blessed life, the very first thing he says in Matthew 5, the very first thing he says is this. He says that God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And catch, I got, it, it's not that you're blessed because you're poor in spirit, it's a blessing because you recognize you need him and now you're open to letting him show up in your story. You're open to letting him move 
and be who he is and bringing you this new life that you need. That's why we're blessed. And, and so, so often this is where the journey of faith starts for us. We come into that place of like, I, I need help. Which is why some people oftentimes make the criticism about following Jesus. Like, oh, you're one of those people? That's just because you're weak. Like, your faith is a crutch. Have you ever heard that? What I, what I try to say in that answer is, dude, it's not a crutch. Like, it's my life support. <laughs> like, I follow Jesus because there is brokenness in my story. So, yes, you're right. I follow him because I want to step into this new life he has for me. And he's so good that he doesn't just give me a crutch. He, like, resets every part of my life and does something new. And see, it's that moment of surrender that allows us to step into this new life with Jesus. But it's not just something we do at the start of the journey with him. Like, surrender, it's an ongoing part of the journey. Because there's always more of this new life that Jesus wants to give us. And if we want to step more fully into it with him, chase after what he has for us, there will oftentimes be moments in our stories where we have to surrender something new to him to experience what he has for us. Like, have you recognized that about your life? Like, have you, if you've followed Jesus for any length of time, have you seen that he has more for you? That there's always something that he wants to lead you deeper into? And so often to experience that requires this thing called surrender because it's surrender that allows us to step into this life with him and it's surrender that allows us to go deeper into this life with him. If we're willing to come to that place, if our posture is willing to say, okay, I trust you. When I hear you whisper the words, let go of whatever I'm holding on to, then I'll step more fully into that life with you. I mean, this is one of the reasons why when we do our musical worship, we, we adopt a posture of arms raised because it's symbolic of this idea of, of a surrendered heart to him. I, I want more of the life you have, so here I am. Take me into this life with you. This posture, this posture of surrender is what allows us to step more fully into this life with Jesus, which is also part of the explanation of why we will get stuck in life. Because there will oftentimes be moments along the way where that whisper comes, let go. And I'll say, I don't want to. I don't want to let this go to you. I, I want to hold on to this thing. It feels so important to me. I, 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 I want to trust you with this part of my life, Jesus. But over here, could you not mess with it, please? <laughs> but you know why he wants to mess with it? Because he loves me. Same reason for you. Because he knows that whatever's going on over here, there's a mess and brokenness that he wants to bring life to as well. And so he'll begin to work on us and challenge us and whisper to us and invite us into more if we're willing to let go, if we're willing to listen to him, if we're willing to believe that he is good and he is for us. And then I can trust him when I let go, and he's going to bring me back to the ground with him, bring me back into the new life he has with me. But it's oftentimes uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good, which is weird to me. Like, I've walked with him long enough that I should know that when he's calling me into some new area of surrender, oh, I can trust you with that because I've seen all the other stuff you've done in my story. But isn't it weird how when the new stuff comes, we're like, I don't, I don't know if I can trust you with that, which I'm so grateful he just doesn't give up with me. He's like, again? I think he's like, Joel, little man. That's what I hear his voice sometimes in my head. Little man, don't you know me? Don't you know I'm good, that you can trust me with this? And what I have seen time and time again, when I take that step with him, when I come into that place of surrender and trust, whether it's with my relationships, my finances, my issues, my struggles, my challenges, my dreams, my future, when I look back at my story, I always see that what Jesus was wanting to do was so much bigger than what I was holding on to. Like every time, every time, he's like, I got a bigger life for you. I'm not trying to make less of you. I'm actually trying to make more of you. I love how C.S. Lewis captures this idea of, of God working in our story as Jesus shows up in, in his book, Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis writes these words. 
He says, imagine yourself as a living house. And so God comes in to rebuild that house. Like when we, when we step into this new life with Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to put my spirit in you to begin to do a new work in you. And so he's coming in to do this new work in us. And so at first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. Like he's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew that those jobs needed to be done. And so you're not all that surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, what on earth is he up to? Well, the explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage but he's building a palace, and he intends to come and live in it with you. Like the life he has for you and me is so much bigger than what we sometimes are holding on to if we're willing to let go. You know, and I've seen this in the journey of my daughters just in their own, their own life and childhood. When, when our youngest Brooklyn was real little, uh, she had a, a pacifier. With, with Indy, I was like that parent that was like anti-pacifier, but Indy didn't need a pacifier, so I thought I was a great parent because I didn't need it. And then you know how like sometimes your kids humble you? Brooklyn humbled us, because it's like that was the only thing that would help, so we'd give her a pacifier. And so the whole time I'm like, how do we get the pacifier away from her as she gets older? Because I've seen like adults walking with them, and it's just really weird. So one day we're hanging out as a family, and we go to Jamba Juice, and we get our drinks, and... Brooklyn had never had Jamba Juice before. And I could just see she was like staring through her like, <laughs> she's just staring at us like, what is that thing you're, you're enjoying? Because it looks different than the thing in my mouth. And, and I just remember like, Brooklyn, you, do you want to you wanna sip of my Jamba Juice? She's like, uh-huh. But she won't remove the pacifier. So I'm like, here's the deal. I'll give this to you if you give me the pacifier. Oh, you could see, you could see the wheels turning. Like, there's this moment of, like, is that worth it? Like, it was, it was fascinating as an, as an adult watching this. And I'm like, it's your choice. And so slowly she, like, pulls the pacifier out of her mouth and reaches up and hands it to me. And then I give, me, I give her my Jamba Juice. She went out of her mind. It was like this flavor explosion she had never had before. And she was just like, this is incredible. And I remember seeing that moment, and I'm like, Jesus, is that what I'm like with you? Like, I'm going through my life holding on to things that seem so important and so precious and so significant to me, and, and you're whispering new life to me. And I'm holding on to a pacifier when you've got so much more. And I, and I make it my prayer, like, Jesus, you have permission to show me the pacifiers in my life. Because I, I want to trust you. So please help me to do that. Help me to see what you're doing. To see the good that you have for me, this new life. Like, you gave up your life so I could have a new life. How could I not trust you with all of me? And so let me ask you a question today. What are you wrestling with Jesus about right now? Imagine you're holding on to that rock wall. And you feel comfortable and secure with the grip you have, but you're not really going anywhere. And you hear Jesus saying, let go. I've got you. What is that thing you're holding on to that you're trusting? And he's saying, no, trust me. And so I would imagine that when I ask that question, for some of us, you know immediately what that is because he's been whispering something to you for a while. So do you believe that he's good? Do you believe that he's for you? Do you believe that he's wanting to lead you into more life? 
See, because I think if we're going to step into the life he has for us as we emerge out of COVID, surrender is the key. Surrender is the path. So what are you wrestling with today? Is it your money? Oh my gosh. I hold on to my money like it's a pacifier all the time. <laughs> M moving here, we had all these dreams and plans and it didn't go the way we thought on so many levels. And yet one of the things that Jesus has constantly been saying is, do you still trust me enough? Do you trust me with your resources? We've had to wrestle that out as a family. Do we really believe you're good? Maybe it's with your attitude. This might be too personal of a question. So do you know someone who has attitude issues that needs some help? You know them, right? <laughs> and maybe in this whole COVID season, God's been showing you something. Because have you noticed COVID doesn't naturally bring out the best in you? <laughs> COVID's felt like driving in traffic for me. When I hit traffic, there's a side of me that comes out that's just not pleasant. And yet what's interesting is like that, that's not, I, I can make an excuse for that. Oh, if it wasn't for the traffic, it's like, no, Joel, that's who you are at some level. <laughs> and yet when those things are revealed, and he's coming into the story whispering, hey, I want to meet you in that place. And that anger, that frustration, whatever it is, I want to help you. Will you let me? Will you surrender this? Maybe it's with your relationships right now. And he's talking to you about this idea of surrendering more of your life to him. Maybe it's an area of forgiveness towards somebody that's just hurt you. And he's saying, I know it makes no sense to forgive them, but do you trust that I actually want to lead you into freedom? Or maybe it's trusting him with your singleness because it's hard to be single. But what, what's the area that you're wrestling with him? And here's the thing about surrender. At first, it always feels like we're losing more than we're gaining. But the reality is that Jesus never wants to make less of us. He always wants to make more of us. To increase who we are. As men and women created in the image of God, do you know how incredible we're meant to become? And he wants to lead us more fully into that. Which is why he says those who love their life in this world will lose it. Well, those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. The trajectory he wants to lead us on is one of forever with him. And so what are you wrestling with Jesus today? Because I want to let you know, on the other side of that thing is more of the life he wants to give you. And so let me pray for us. And we're going to go into a time of worship. And I want to invite you in this time of worship to posture yourself in surrender to him. And let him speak the life he has for you. So where's your You can come on up while I'm praying. Jesus, thank you that you are so good to us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you came to give us new life. And thank you that you have more of that life for us. And thank you that you do whisper to us and you challenge us because you don't want us to settle for less than everything you've got. And so would you give us ears to hear what you're saying and, and a heart that says, I trust you, even if it's hard. I believe that you're good. I know you have life for me. May we experience more of that life as we're chasing after you. And so we want to come into your presence right now and through these songs, make them prayers to you. So come and speak to us. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and posture yourselves in worship right now.
your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Thank you for coming out today. So this is our last patio service because we're going back to regular in-person services on Easter Sunday, which is in two weeks. How awesome is that? So we're going to be meeting here at 10 a.m. And this will all be finished by then. <laughs> it's going to be a great time. And if you're not able to join us on any given Sunday, you can, you can stream. We'll be streaming out the service, and we'll have it recorded. You can take it in later. We don't, we don't want to miss anyone. We're going to walk into the season together as a church community, and we're going to open our arms wide and invite anyone and everyone who's ready to encounter Jesus to join us every single week, and it's going to be awesome. So thank you for coming out today. A couple of things as you're wrapping up. Um, if you can't prepare to give, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can visit Phil at the table in the back, right there. There he is, yep, at the round table. <laughs> He's got some envelopes if you want to give that way. If you got that app downloaded, you can give right through the app. It's connected to your account once you log in, so that's a way that you can do that. And I want to encourage you to get that app downloaded because the lyrics we're going to be singing for our songs, that's how we'll have it. We were going to get a projector screen out here, but we were like, okay, how bright does it have to be? That technology doesn't exist yet, so it's got to be brighter than the sun. So someday, but until then, we're going to hold it on our hands and our phones. <laughs> so that's the way we're going to do it. So have a great rest of your day. We will see you later. Thanks for coming. We love you. Bye-bye.